Man, I talked to uh, uh, the assistant GM for uh, OKC. Where we were, in, we were in his office and we were talking, and uh, you know, he kept it one hundred with me. He didn't try to sell me a dream. He didn't try to say, "Hey, this is what it's gonna be." He was like, "Listen, it's the minimum worth." What do you? How do you put it? Uh, he basically told me it's the minimum worth playing, being the tenth, thirteenth guy. Maybe not playing, maybe play sometime, or actually being somewhere where you want to be, and they actually want you, and you're making a lot more money. He's like, me personally, I wouldn't do it. This is assistant GM telling me this. He's like, I wouldn't do it. Uh, I wouldn't ask you to do it. I wouldn't ask my son to do something like that. Welcome back to the Role Player Podcast. I am Jordan Taylor, joined by my co-host Stanford Gentleman. 11-year overseas vet and CEO co-founder of Swiss Cultures, the one and only Anthony Goods. What's happening, man? What's good with you? Man, I'm chilling, man. You keep wearing these hats. I'm going to have to get you a Swiss hat, man. You over there hurting, boy. That, the hairline leaking. We got to get you a fitted, though. The hairline leaking out that uh, <laughs> out the front door. Pull that shit down real quick, you know what I'm saying? It gets, it's tough times, man. Winter's coming type shit. You know, it's hard out here. You see how I just cut the whole little hair part out the episode because nah, you know, nah, 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 yeah, nah. I'm, I'm fucked up right now. My beard making my face look fat. Damn, I'm just, <laughs> yeah, it's tough. It's tight on me, man. It's tight. All right, we got a very special guest today, man. We got a, a Euro League champion, a Euro League Final Four MVP, all first team, all Euro League first team and second team, a three time BTB League champion. A Turkish Super Cup winner, a Turkish League All Star, and all Israeli League second team, Israeli League top scorer, which is crazy for real. Uh, uh, B- Bundesliga All Star, and then of course back to his college days, Big Twelve, All Big Twelve player. We got the one and only Mr. Will Clyburn. Will, appreciate you joining us. Man, man. I appreciate you for having me, man. Thanks a lot. I should probably just did this a while ago. I remember y'all asking me about this uh, a minute ago, probably. Hey, man, uh, yeah, we glad you could get on here. You know, everybody got yeah. busy schedules these days. We all getting grown and shit like that. So we just appreciate you catching up with us, man, for real. So don't even trip. Don't even trip. But look, man, we're going to start with your journey, man. We just mentioned you've been you've been in quite a few places, not not all over the place, but you've been Germany, Israel, uh, Russia, and now back to Turkey. Turkey, two stints, two different stints, two different teams. Uh, so we just want to talk about your journey, um, you know, how you – you know, started in Ulm, um, uh, or went to Ulm, um, went to Halone, went crazy in Halone, which is, what you average over there? Like 20, 21, something like that. But you was having 35, 36. Bro, I, was, I was getting off there, man. That was, <laughs> that was fun. We was, we was getting our ass kicked, but uh, it, it was fun. <laughs> it was definitely fun out there. Yeah, you got to play for Dan Shamir, who was an assistant for uh, Tori Messina and Cheska, and now back there with uh, with him in Milan now. So, what what was that like playing? He's man, I love Dan. He's a he's a dope coach. Man, man. you know what, man? Uh, Dan came in. Uh, I want to say six or seven games after uh, after we lost a couple. Uh, they fired mm-hmm. the coach, and he came in and he brought me in. And I listen, you got to score the ball. You got to uh, you got to carry this team. And basically, man, he gave me the ultimate freedom. Like, more freedom than I've ever had playing basketball, ever. <laughs> and he just, hey, go out there and play. It was times where he had three, four guys setting screens at me at one time. Like, just go play, <laughs> go try to score. And, man, I love Dan, man. Dan, like, started everything, I want to say, from me getting to this point. From the phone calls he made after that season, everything happened because of him. Everything. Uh, man. man, you know, after that year, I averaged 20 points, led the league in scoring, and I didn't sign a contract until September. Mm. Like, no, it, it, wasn't even, it wasn't even September. No, that was the year before. Like, it was – I was still in the summertime with no deal. No deal at all. It was crazy to me. No deal you liked or like no deal at all? It was a struggle. It was okay. a struggle. It, it came down to maybe we have this team. Uh, it was a team out of Avellino in Italy. Mm. 
And that was a slow process. And uh, Dan called me one day just to check up on me. Just regularly just checking up on me. Like, how's it going? Uh, you got a team yet? And I'm like, no, I'm still still waiting. Uh, he said, okay, I'm going to call you back. Uh, he didn't call me back. David Black called me. Uh, and I don't know if you know, them two are like best friends. Yeah, so he yeah. called me and was like, hey, man, uh, we got an open spot here. I'd love for you to join us, blah, blah, blah. Uh, come to Dar Shafaka. We got, we got minutes. We got some money. Uh, like I said, come play EuroLeague. And that's how that all happened. Like that, just like that. So uh, that's crazy. Mm-hmm. All right, it was it was insane. Did it? Did it never? You didn't want to go back to Halone, obviously. Or what stopped you from pulling the trigger on going back to Halone? It was just uh, obviously you, the money wise. Uh, I thought I played way better than, uh, like I said, what I was making. And obviously, you want to yeah. keep taking steps up. I had already took a step back. Nothing against Halone, but yeah. coming from Germany, playing Euro Cup to going back a level, playing Israeli league, only one game a week. I had already took a step back, so I'm like, I don't want to stay at this level. So it was more about uh, just trying to keep going forward, keep pushing the needle forward. Damn, that's, that's crazy as hell. So I guess, man, we, we talk a lot about, you know, Americans and how it's different for Americans and international players. Um, so I guess for you, how how difficult was it changing roles kind of every year? You know, you went from home and playing Euro Cup where, you know, you probably, you know, obviously you got to you got to shoot and do all that. And probably you, you've always been like a Swiss Army knife to to, to some extent um, to go to have to score the ball back to being a Swiss Army knife. How difficult is it to change roles every year? And what do you take pride in the most on the floor? What part of your game do you take most pride in? <sighs> You know what, man? Surprisingly, it's not a huge adjustment for me, man. Uh, okay. Surprisingly, I've played for, like, some great coaches. And uh, they never tried to change who I was. They never tried to make me do something differently. They always let me have my complete freedom uh, from Black, from Dan Shamir to Atutis to Ottoman Na. Like, everybody has gave me complete freedom. I think the... I want to say the probably the biggest adjustment for me is like uh, going from Halone to Dar Shafaka, Dar Shafaka to Cheska was had, being surrounded by other talented guys, like really talented guys where I'm not the first option. I'm not the second option. So you damn near have to just get in where you fit in. And uh, I think that was probably the the biggest adjustment at the same time. You could just put me on the floor, and I say this to people all the time, like, I'm going to get mine somewhere. I'm going to – just being on the floor, having minutes, I'm going to find mine somewhere around the floor. Uh, That's rebounding, that defense. I already know defense and rebound is going to keep me on the floor. It's been doing wonders for me so far. Right. (laughs) But like I said, if you keep me on the floor, I'm going to get some points here and there. I'm going to – back door, some free throws, some fouls. It don't matter, but yeah, I think uh, I think that was probably the biggest adjustment for me, just playing with other talented guys, especially when I got to Cheska. That was, we were loaded. Man, yeah, yeah, those Cheska teams, man, I mean, I think that uh, I can only, I can only imagine what improvement that does just even in, even in practice, you know what I'm saying? Just, just having that level of talent, you know what I'm saying? Uh, to, to play against. And then kind of like you said, I mean, you score from so many, I would say in so many different ways. Um, how do you, so how do you go into like, let's just say going year after year, how do you go about like treating like a weakness? Like where do you, where do you put your focus on like year to year? Do you base it off of, okay, I felt like I didn't shoot let's just say, like, pull-ups the greatest this year, so I'm going to go into the offseason focusing on that or whatever because, I, I mean, I feel like, you know, it'll be one game you're getting off in the post. It's another game you're getting off on isolations. You know what I'm saying? It's just uh, it's something different, but how do you go about, like, tailoring your game year in and year out? Uh, Me and my guy in the summertime, David uh, David Bell, uh, 
like I said, he watches a lot of my games. And the one thing that he kind of focused on is my post work and, like I said, that mid-range area. And that's kind of, I want to say, the part where I need the most work at, usually in the summertime to attack. And surprisingly, each year they've used me more and more in the post. Each year. It went from on, no posting, really. Uh, alone, no posting. Even Dar Shafaka, it was very limited posting. And then when I went to Cheska, it was, hey, any mismatch, you go down low. So after I had that one year, I'm like, okay, I got to work on my post game and try to add another dimension to it. I feel like I was always okay post player, but it was still some stuff I needed to add it, uh, add to my game when it came to the post. So I think that's probably it, man, just – seeing where these coaches are going to play you at. I always try to have that conversation before I get to a team either, too. Uh, I, how are you planning on using me? What do you want me to do, like I said, to fit into the offense? And they always tell me exactly what I need. And a two this for sure, it was post-work and spot-up jump shots. Yeah, so uh, – how- how many, how many, how many of these dudes like you ask them what they gonna use you for? Is it always accurate? And then these dudes go against, like you know, what I'm saying. You know, so 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 far, man, it's been accurate, man. Uh, <laughs> I still remember the first conversation I had with uh Tudis uh before I went to Cheska. We talked about my three point shot. He was like, "Listen, uh, there's nothing wrong with your shot. Uh, you have good form. There's nothing wrong with your shot. You just need to keep shooting and keep working." Because I don't know if every, I don't know if everybody knows this. Uh, I played against Madrid in the playoffs with Dar Shafaka. It was uh we had we were the A C. They were the one seed. The first two games I was destroying them. I was getting when I wanted to get into the basket. The third game they came out with a game plan. Nobody stepped above the free throw line. <laughs> Nobody steps above it. Whoever's guarding me, you stay below the free throw line. And the first time you catch the ball, you look like, man, I'm why am I so open? Clank. <laughs> I I come down again, open again, clank. And man, that right there, it was it destroyed me, man. That was I wanna say that was a turning point. That was a turning point for me. Well, I'm like, man, I can never let this shit happen to me again. Ain't too, ain't too many cats say they've been Bron though before. They did bro. you like pop did Bron in the play. Bro, hey man, <laughs> he, bro, they they sat below that free throw line. And me being me, I still tried to drive. I still tried to get in there. <laughs> and I'm like, so yeah, man. Uh, I think that was kind of a big key for me, man. Because when I got the Cheska, man, he literally played me exactly like other people would do. Go under the screen. He said out loud. Go under the screen. Don't check them out there. Talking to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's talking crazy, man. And I'm like, hey, I got to shoot it. So, and when I got there, man, if I shot it, that was it. It didn't matter if I miss or make, take the shot. It's so. Did you see that the rest of the series, or what happened at like with the day? Oh yeah, they destroyed. That, they destroyed us after that because of. I couldn't get to the basket, and I wasn't hitting down. I wasn't knocking down the jump shot. So it was, it was curtains after that. Mm. So they basically took me out of the game. Damn, <laughs> yeah, man, it was right. It was, it was embarrassing, man. Oh, it was embarrassing. Uh, so what did you, what did you take into the summer? That was it. Was it just straight jump shots for the oh. first month, two months of the summer? Man, uh. I want to say, uh, where was I at that summer, man? I was in Michigan with my pops that summer. Uh, my pops. And uh, it was days where I would have him rebound for me. And uh, I had to make 10 in a row each spot. I wouldn't move. I didn't care. I didn't care how many I missed. I was not leaving that gym until I made 10 in a row each spot. So it was days where, man, he was exhausted. Because I wouldn't let him leave. I'm like, bro, we're not leaving until I do this. So, it was mostly that, man. It was so many spot-ups going into that summer, like, nonstop. Nonstop spot-ups. I refused to have that to happen to me again. Hey, man, hey, listen. It was embarrassing, man. <laughs> yeah, it was tough. 
So, so we said we watching you the other night against Red Star. We noticed too, uh, Adam. He got you even playing point guard now a little bit, right? With uh, it looks like you play playing the one or bringing the ball up, initiating the offense. And obviously, we touched on uh, you playing on the block and all that. So, that being said, you have a different array of skills. You're not really a wing no more. So, do you think the wing position is becoming extinct in in Europe? Like I said, it's a lot of bigs, a lot of combo guards and hybrid forwards like yourself. So what is, do, you, do you think the wing position is becoming extinct, or what's your thoughts on that? Man, I don't know, man. Uh, I really don't know. Uh, I feel like uh, there's only a couple of us left where they can uh, kind of create those wing mismatches, I guess. Uh, I still think that I'm kind of the only one as of right now. I'm pretty sure there's some coming up that uh, – and kind of do those different things. Uh, you put a bigger guy on me, he's too slow. You put a smaller guy on me, take him down. But I don't know, man. Uh, I probably have to look into the league and see the wings that are coming up and whatnot. But I feel like I feel like everybody's a combo now. I feel like if you strictly just play the wing, like if you playing like it like, limits you. You know, you could yeah, it, it does. Or you're just a shooter. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah. It limits you're, you or you're just a shooter, like everybody's combo guard, hybrid forward. You're gonna play some three, you're gonna play some four, or you're just like a straight big. But because you got a, uh, uh, you got Vasa, you got Shane. They're gonna do most of the ball handling. And then, like I said, if you a wing position, you stuck into that three and D guy. So it's mm. yeah. Uh, Hold on, are you considering yourself still a wing? Nah, I'm. Uh, no, nah, I can't even. Sure. I can't even say I'm a wing anymore. Uh, because <laughs> right now, like I said, if Voss is tired and he got, obviously they're gonna put a a tough guy on Voss or Shane, and they can't be dribbling the ball up the floor every possession to get into the offense. So, like I said, me bringing the ball up the floor just takes pressure off them. Now they can come and score in a half set, a half court set, and not work as hard to get the ball up the floor against pressure full court. I, I feel like I feel like it's not even the wings are not even three and D guys. I feel like they just three guys in Euroleague. Like, <laughs> hey man, it's 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 getting like to everything. that point, man. It's getting to that point. It's getting to that point. <laughs> Yo, what uh, what uh, what similarities do you see between Ephes and then Jessica being on being with the being with the two programs? The freedom. Uh, when you have talented players, talented guards, we had Nando, we had Chacho, we had Corey. Like, you get those guys freedom, it's nothing you can do. It's nothing you can do. And then the same thing, you got Vasa and Shane. They had the ultimate freedom to play their game how they want to. Now, if you got guys that are in the system, sometimes they're not as talented because they have to play within this offense and within the system. But this guy is just a hey, – Go play your game, and you have the freedom to do what you need to do, to score the ball or make plays. And I think that's probably the the biggest similarity right there. It's like you have great great guards, and you got a coach that's giving you ultimate freedom. So that being said, what's uh, you had like you said, you had a lot of freedom in Halone, and then uh, you went to Cheska, and you said you wasn't the first, second, or whatever option, you know, third, fourth option, whatever. What do you think for a guy coming overseas? If you had to, if you had a choice, what's better for development? Is it better to be that guy on Halone, or is it better to try and you know be in Ulm or whatever it is and you know fit in, be maybe the third, fourth option on a really good team? Better to be the man on a bad team or trying to try and learn how to play on a good team? You know, me personally, I'm gonna go with Halone first. I mean, uh, Germany first. I'm going to go to Germany. Uh, just because, man, the struggle for me learning the the way the Europeans play, the physicality was different. Um, even, like, running with the ball, I was getting called for travel when I first got here. Got open step. Like, sometimes you would rather be a role player just – Learning the steps and then finding your way that way. And then later on, because you come in right away as the guy, they expect everything from you. 
right away. And you know how these teams are over here. Like, if you're not producing and you the guy, that's it. Mm-hmm. So I think that was best for me to just come there where it's a team that's already established and I can kind of find my way within the system and, like, okay, this is where I'm going to flourish at. This is where I'm going to play. Because uh, when I first got to Germany, I struggled that first year. I didn't start playing until – like January, January, February is when I really started to get adjusted and start to actually play. So those first couple months, if I'm the guy, there's no way I make it that long. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. That's it. Yeah. Go ahead. Ed. No, I was gonna say, man. I think it. I think it's important too, because like if you come in as the man, then once you do elevate to a team where you're not, now you have so much. You got so much BS to deal with mentally and on the court, you know, just trying to adjust. Like, I mean, I don't think people put into uh, take into account just the uh, just the adjustment, just being in Europe, especially as a young guy, like just being in Europe. There's just so much you got to adjust to just from the temperament of coaches and, you know, your teammates and all that other stuff. Like, so I do think it's important to kind of have, especially when, before you get to those higher levels to have that that experience, you know, like you said, just, just learning how not to travel and, you know, just how to deal with, you know, just everything around you because there's going to come a point where you're not the focal point and yeah. then you're going to have to adjust. And then you don't want to end up having that be a bad situation. It was, uh, I want to say, uh, when I came from Halone to Dr. Fokker, they had Brad Wanamaker. They had James Anderson that just left from the league. They had Scotty Wilbekin that was already there the year before. They had guys that had already played on a level of making crazy money at the time. And uh, when I first came here, I'm like, all right, you know, they got their guys. I'm the last pickup. I ain't going to really play. I'm going to use the experience, take whatever they're giving me, and then go about my business. But he came to me and was like, listen, act like you belong here. You're going to play. I'm going to give you an opportunity. And you just got to go out there and take advantage of it. And that's kind of what happened in that in that aspect. Uh, I ended up playing more than the guys that they were supposed to be the guys. And But I was okay with the adjustments. I was okay with fitting in a role at the same time. I think I'm okay with fitting in any role uh, with any team, basically. Uh, that's... I want to say that's the kind of what I pride myself on, just being able to fit in in any situation. See, you you kind of you kind of unique talent in Europe, I'd say, where like you six eight, you can handle the ball, you can shoot it, like you you really don't have, like even if you don't have like maybe a supreme straight, you don't have a weakness for damn sure. Like you good at you good at everything. So I say, but for most guys in Europe, it's tough because it's like. You have to, like you said, you have to be the man. You have to produce in order to get to that higher level. And then yeah. once you get to that higher level, it's still like this weird taboo in Europe where it's like, all right, you know, you, you got to do exactly what's asked of you. Otherwise, it's not going to be enough. You know what I mean? Like these, these European guys, for instance, they they kind of grow up whether – I was watching the game, like someone like Lazic or, or what's his name from Red Star. Mm-hmm. That man been playing defense, picking up full and fouling dudes. For, hey, three and D. For 15. And, <laughs> and, and, and he the one, I'm, I'm going to take the three out. He just D. Uh, pause. <laughs> he, just, he, just, he, just, he just D. And he been doing that his whole career. Whereas Americans, you know, I don't, I don't think Americans typically are afforded that luxury. So – I feel sure. like it's tough. I guess that's why it's, I asked no the way. first question. It's, it's tough. It's tough to um, – I feel like the game is really slanted in that way, and it's tough to navigate that space uh, of of kind of of finding the balance of what you have to do night in, night out. Yeah, I agree. So, uh, definitely, definitely America is not going to get away with that. There's no way you get away with that right there. <laughs> I can't even think of one – No, I, I can't think of one guy that can get away with with that right there. Yeah, it, just playing defense, hell. Just nah. playing defense, and nah, nah. You, you know, you know who it was. Somebody said. Uh, somebody tried to say it was it was Dante Draper when he was with Madrid, and we got in a hole. And I don't, I don't even know if y'all, but it was like he did that in Madrid, but he was in Sevilla getting to it. 
You know, I never he, seen he, a, he, I never he, seen the Madrid Dante Draper man. I never actually seen him. I mean, he was he was out there chill, chilling. Honestly, he had a from what I saw. I don't know the ins and outs of, but he had a great job. Man was playing some defense and like shit. I well, I wish I could go out there and just go. You know what I'm saying? Get a million dollars to play fifteen minutes and, and uh, pick up. You know, what hey, saying? ain't but, bad at all. Hey, but Americans got to Americans got to prove. Uh, Americans got to prove things way beyond, uh, pretty much beyond the shadow of a doubt as opposed to international players. And I guess my, my question, I'm just I'm making a statement, my question would be for both of y'all, is the game becoming a little too slanted towards international players? And me and Ann have talked about kind of how being an international player is the best thing you could be right now. But is the game on both sides, NBA and, and Europe, becoming too slanted towards international players? Uh, I'm going to go uh, – I'm going to go with – if we talking about over here, I'm gonna go with just go with the situation because some guys, sometimes some guys they depend on the Americans. Mm-hmm. Like some teams, uh, like some of the Europeans is not playing. Some of the homegrown kids is not playing. But for sure, and I'm gonna say this for sure, they have an advantage when it comes to the eye test across the water. Uh, like say in mm-hmm. the states, for sure they. They have the advantage by far. Uh, just, I think there's a lot more talented people. Just in my opinion, a lot more talented people uh, in the states. In the states. In the yeah. states, than these young European kids that I don't know. Not all of them. I'm not gonna say all of them, but they definitely get more of a leeway when it comes to it. Yeah. Definitely get more. I of think. A leeway. I think. I think too, man. I think just the basketball world as a whole puts too much. Uh, they they invest a little too much in this narrative that like, oh, he's playing with grown men, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. It's like it's like you swear like you ain't got high school kids playing against grown men in the states, like you know what I mean. And I think that you know they look at a kid and like, oh, okay, he's playing with grown men, but he's playing five minutes a game or whatever it is. And I just I just don't think that that narrative predicts whether this player is going to be a good player because at the end of the day he's not athletic enough he's got to get stronger you know what i mean and there's just there's just so many other parts to the game but i think the uh the international players especially in regards to the league you know they're, they're, they're definitely uh they fit right into that agenda in regards to you know the nba trying to trying to globalize and expand on the business side and i think you know in europe obviously they're always going to get and this is just generally speaking, I feel like they're always going to get the advantage because in Europe, I mean, you got to invest in your hometown or, you know, the, uh, the the native players. You know what I'm saying? That's how you move the league forward. So it's like that has to be part of your agenda. You know what I'm saying? So I get it. Um, but, yeah, I mean, they're, they're definitely afforded some things that, you know, Americans can't. But – you also you also got to take into account the the grown men that they playing like you can't just say grown men like I'm, what grown men man like who y'all <laughs> like who y'all talking about for real but I, I would also say not only and and will I kind of want to hear what what you got to say about this um I would also say not just the younger kids but at an older level you take and no disrespect uh, to anybody but at the older level the compazos the dudes like that. I feel like it's more they're more inclined to give them guaranteed NBA deals and kind Guaran- of you know stuff like guaranteed, that. Guaranteed, man. So, it's- so tell I mean tell me what you think about that and then also tell me you've been Euroleague seven years now, widely regarded by damn near consensus as a top five, top ten Euroleague player. So what why have you gotten any guaranteed NBA offers? And if so, why not? Uh <clears throat> We've always, every summer, we go and evaluate the summer, and we're like, okay, what are we going to do? Uh, we're going to call around, see what's going on. And the closest I've been was to, to OKC, the closest I've been. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was one of the situations where a team was offering me, Jessica was offering me at the time, three years, guaranteed money. And this team was offering me one year minimum and who knows if I'm the 10th, 7th, 13th guy. Who knows? It was so much, like I said, unknown there. And obviously, 
I'm I'm about to be I don't know how old I was then, three years ago, twenty nine. I'm like, there's no way I go take a chance with one year minimum, not knowing if I'm gonna play and actually get the the opportunity to really like to go out there and hoop or I can take three years guaranteed money and I'm somewhere where I'm going to be the guy. So I think uh, every summer was like that. Every summer we got calls and every summer it was, oh, we can't do anything to July. Oh, we can't do anything until after free agency starts. But, you know, over Europe, all the good jobs are gone. June, May, like they're signing people early. So it was, I guess it was more about safety for me uh, than that because uh, we got called all the time. Uh, come was, to camp. Was, the minimum was guaranteed? The minimum was guaranteed, but it was always come to camp, come here, come chill with us for the summer. Come, the Clippers wanted me to come uh, be with them for the summertime. OKC asked me to be with them for the summertime. But I'm like, what do I, what am I going to get out of this? Yeah. Uh, at what point, well, like, what am I, I'm missing my summer. That's to be the main thing. I'll be missing the summer. And for something that maybe it's not guaranteed. Did you feel like uh, that you could go back to Europe at any time? You know what I mean? Like, did you feel like, say you go to OKC and if it doesn't work out, you could go back to Cheska or you could go back to Maccabi and it wouldn't, and just kind of seamlessly fit back in and save money? <laughs> Uh, I always, I always thought I could come back to Europe, but I want y'all to uh, check this out. So say I leave Cheska. Say I leave Cheska, and obviously I'm the guy at Cheska. And obviously they got to replace me. They bring the next guy in, and he's playing great. That spot is gone. I'm not getting that back. I can't. The money is not the same. I can't get that spot back. So... And that goes for any place. That goes for any place else. If you come in back, I'm not saying you got to start over, but that price range is not the same. That that spot may not be the same. Uh, it was never a doubt that I can come back over here, but it was just the spot where I'm making the most of it. I'm making the most money, and I'm gonna have the opportunity to really play my game again. So I think that was it for me. Does a does a part of you um, wish you would have took a chance? Because I mean, I think everybody, everybody that's familiar with Euro League basketball knows that your game seems like it's like perfect for the league. Like especially you know these days, and I mean even before. I mean you know, but th does a part of you wish like, man, I wish I would have took a chance and, and, and seen what happened? Oh uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, but I gotta live with it. That's something I gotta live with. Uh, definitely. Uh, every time I get a phone call or a text about it, uh, it's like, man, did I did I sell myself short? It's always, it's always that that thought in the back of my head. I try not to think about it too much because I want to drive myself crazy, but it's, it's always that thought in the back of my head. Cause I feel like I, if I could have had the right opportunity, that. I could have established myself there and been all right. So, yeah, it's yeah, it's just something I'm gonna have to live with for sure. But I think in a in a in a way, you kind of got closure in the sense that like you had a guaranteed deal, even if yeah. it was for the minimum. So it's not yeah. a it's not a question of like skill. It's just more so opportunity. You know, analyzing your own situation as far as like you know what you want to do financially, and then. Um, you know, and then also like, I think, I don't know, man, I, I just think giving some of these guys the minimum, you know, especially established players like in yeah. Europe, I think that that's just, I, I don't know. I, I just think it's, it's kind of, it's kind of disrespectful at, at times, but it's man, you know, I talk to the Americans, man, I talked to, uh, the assistant GM for, uh, OKC where we were in, we we're in his office and we were talking and, uh, You know, he kept it 100 with me. He didn't try to sell me a dream. He didn't try to say, hey, this is what it's going to be. He was like, listen, it's the minimum worth. What do you, how do you put it? Uh, he basically told me it's the minimum worth playing, being the 10th, 13th guy, maybe not playing, maybe play sometime, 
or actually being somewhere where you want to be and they actually want you and you're making a lot more money. It's like me personally, I wouldn't do it. This is assistant GM telling me this. He's like, I wouldn't do it. Uh, I wouldn't ask you to do it. I wouldn't ask my son to do something like that. And that right there was like, it's, that's like, he kept it 100 with me. He told me exactly what it was. And it was no way I could say, yeah, I, I want to do this. <laughs> it was, I, I, I want to come play the minimum, for the minimum, man. I want to be the 10th or 13th guy. I'm still young. I still can play. So I think that was it for me, man. It, that right, that conversation right there was like, all right, I'm, I'm done. And whatever happens, happens. And I still don't think, uh, Obviously, I, I like my, I like both my agents. I like both of them. Uh, for sure, Mishko never wanted me to leave here. I don't know if you guys know Mishko. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he, he definitely, he definitely wanted me to leave. He always had some early for me, early where it, it's damn near. I don't even have a chance to even make it to the summertime. So he always had some early for me where it's like, hey, listen, this is. This is good money. You probably won't get this if you wait any longer. So it was always something like that where I never even gave it a chance to get to that point. Hmm. Well, on the on the on the topic of the NBA, we gotta ask. It's a hot button topic right now. Who you taking, Victor or Scoop, number one overall? Bro, I watched that game and. Uh, I watched some of Vic's. Uh, I haven't watched much of the Scoot, but uh, bro, Vic is unreal. Unreal. Nobody at that size is moving like that. Nobody. You can't teach that. You can't teach seven four. Even though my man's probably physically more ready, but just the uh, the what if you can't take Scoot over Vic. There's just no way you can. I mean, I, th- I think you get fired if you take if you take Scoot over Vic. Like, yeah, just, for sure. Just off, just, off the strength yeah. of, just off the strength of what you're saying. But I did see someone say that Scoot was a safer pick for the reason, just because he's more physically ready. Is probably maybe a lower ceiling, but a more but a higher floor. How, how tall is Scoot? Six foot. Yeah, he's somewhere around there. Nah, nah, I can't go with him. But <laughs> I can't go with I mean him, the uh, thing is with Scoot, I feel like Scoot is uh I feel like Scoot is great, but I mean I think that it still takes a while for these guys to like develop. Like you know what I mean? It, unless he's Ja Morant. You know what I mean? And I I mean I've heard people trying to give him those type of comparisons, but I mean even a Ja Morant type of player, like that comes around every what five, six years, you know what I'm saying? So it's like to really pass up on seven four with an eight foot wingspan, and 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 try to put your franchise in the hands of somebody that's six four. Granted, it is a guards league. I don't know. I just think it's a. I just think it's a risk, and I think that Victor, Victor has um, repeated. Victor's repeatedly showed us that when the lights are on and it means it means the most, he's gonna compete. Like it was against him and Scoot. The summer before was uh, versus him and Chet. You know what I mean? I think that, um, you know, Victor, he, he's competitive, bro, and he shows out. Like, he had 36 and 37, like, back-to-back nights. Hey, listen, you can't say anything about him. I, I don't care. Uh, it's, you can't teach that, man. And then he had the crazy work ethic. Right. And I don't think people realize that, like uh, – I remember when we were going to play them, and he was the last one in the gym, still shooting. Mm-hmm. Like, we had to wait for him to get off the floor. And right. uh, he was still putting in time, put, still putting in shots. And everybody that I've heard about him he said the same thing. Like, he loves to work. Yeah. So. Yeah, no, I talked to – I talked to uh, I talked to one of his trainers. He works out with a trainer here in the States, man. And he said, like – he said that – and he and they, he said he's worked with D Wade. He's worked with a bunch of players, and he said that he thinks that Victor could be the best player that he's ever trained because he said like number one physically he's got everything, but he said like this kid wants to be the best player like ever. Like he wants to be the best, and I think that 
you know, when you got that kind of a mentality. And then when he said, uh, I guess when he's in a press conference and he said, like, you know, Scoot's the best player. He's a good player. And, uh, you know, he, he probably would deserve to be number one if I wasn't right. born. The when he said that line. as a French kid, I was like, all right. The coldest <laughs> line ever. I was like, wow. <laughs> no, that was – but do you see – when y'all – uh, like I said, I watched a couple games over here, like when he's playing with, like I said, the European teams. Like the way he's blocking shots and having people just looking like kids or when he's doing post moves and the guy is nowhere near able to contest. It's almost yeah. like he's playing with kids in general, and these are playing with grown mm-hmm. men. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Nah, yeah, the ball's coming off always... the rim, and he's just throwing his own shot up, dunking the ball. It, it don't it look like a cartoon. <laughs> it's funny to me, like uh, if you look at like some of his blocks on like switches or like pick and rolls, you see like players just have a a tough time judging the gap. <laughs> you know what I mean? The gap between him and like, oh, I can get this shot off. <laughs> And then as soon as that hand come up, it's, there's nothing you can do. It's over. Uh, he didn't got me it's before. Over. He didn't. He didn't got me before. Oh, did he? Well, I'm, like, hey, uh, I'm like, uh, maybe I should have dunked that one. Man, I don't know why I try to just lay it up. <laughs> but yeah, he didn't got me before like that, man. Yeah. I'm a, man. Listen, it's no way he goes anything but number one. You, you, you taking him over eighteen year old Brian? No. <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's hard because I've already seen Brown's body of work. Yeah, you know, facts. But yeah. even then, Brown was uh, back then. <laughs> so, body wise, body wise, Brown was like you seen Brown's body and you seen how he was moving and jumping, and you were like, all right, this it's, was. It's, it's, I'm still taking Brown. He, the way he was moving, he, how fast he was, nah, he like, there's no way. He the only he the only uh he the only prospect what in the last said that we've seen that you can even ask that question though. Yeah, easily. Yeah. I'm, fact. I'm curious. I would have loved to see who they would have took uh him over Chet if they're in the same draft class. Oh, big. Everybody had high hopes on Chet. Nah, but hey. No, nah, I think Chet's good. And quiet as it's kept, the way uh, OKC looking uh, this year, they might be in the running for this month. Man, that shit would be crazy. Hey, they, that would be they crazy if they had Chet, had somebody Chet and sure. Victor. Somebody for sure tanking. I don't know who's going to do it. Yes, you do. Bro, it's a race to the <laughs> yeah, bottom. Say, yes, you do. Everybody. <laughs> <laughs> you know exactly who's doing it. <laughs> hey, but – uh, but look, man, you spent, like we said before, you spent five years, five, seven years uh, in EuroLeague, five of them in Cheska. How important it was uh, finding a home and that continuity of being in one place to your to your performance, uh, particularly overseas? Uh, um, I guess you can say it's really important, man. Just knowing where I was going to be every summer. It was never the stress of going through worried about where my next deal was. I think that's – it's always a ba- – uh, you're able, always able to sleep better at night knowing that. Like I said, I'm going to be here for the next three years, and that's it. But I said, my kid, uh, my son was there shit, all five years of his life. He's only five now. So this is probably the first place he's been to outside of Russia. Uh, but, yeah, I want to say, yeah, it's – I want to say that's important, man. Just being comfortable, and we were definitely comfortable there. It was never a point where I'm like, yeah, I want to leave here. Uh, I didn't plan on it. I had signed two more. I signed two more years before uh, the whole war thing broke out and stuff. So I planned on being there for seven years. Mm-hmm. You, so you you wear it. It was like one of the things. Where, you wear it as like a badge of honor. Uh, and I feel like shit. How many how many Americans, especially in Euroleague? There's not a lot of Americans that get to stay in one place for stay in shit, one place even two years for real. So to stay in one place for five for five years, like I, I, I view that as like damn, like they should low key. I don't know if they're gonna retire your well, number jersey with. there, but it's got to be you know some type of ring of honor at least some. <laughs> I t- I talked to him about that and I'm like man, listen, I don't want to leave here. I told him before like this is where I want to finish it. Obviously. Everything happened and I couldn't do it like I wanted to. 
But like I said, that's why I said I'll go back just to finish there, just to play my last year mm. there if I could, if they would bring me back. But I was – like I said, I plan on being there for seven years. <laughs> I was definitely going to mm. finish there. I didn't plan on leaving. Uh, it was home, uh, and I felt like I was one of them. So it was never – a sense of like, man, I need to get the hell out of here. Right. right. Yeah. The only thing that got me out of there this year was just because I couldn't do the the VTB one game a week. Uh, I still wanted to play yearly. I feel like I still needed some – accomplished some stuff that I haven't accomplished yet. So I wanted to win another year league title. I still got other stuff I want to do. So I just definitely didn't want to, like, to lead that where I'm like, man, what if? Yeah. Keep writing that story, man. But um kinda kinda backtracking going back to the uh to the Victor situation, the Victor versus the uh the Ignite. One of Victor's teammates, uh he was also a former teammate of mine, his name is Steve Ho You Fat. Uh went viral um after playing the Ignite because of his last name and uh Steve's now going to start selling jerseys with his name on it. And it's funny because back when we played together in France, like I had a bunch of people in my DMs like, yo, bro, get his jersey. Like I'll pay for it, you know, that type of thing. And now I I, I was kind of I was kind of happy to see that because he's going to actually, you know, start to make some money off of his name as opposed to people just laughing about it, joking about it online. But uh, so I guess the question is, should overseas players be able to profit off of let's say like Jersey sales and, you know, some of the, uh, some of the opportunities that they bring to these teams overseas. No, I think so. Uh, I'm happy for doing because that's, that's big. Uh, I'll buy that Jersey myself. <laughs> uh, I'll definitely buy that Jersey. Uh, yeah, I think people should, man. Uh, obviously everyone else is doing it. Everyone else is making money off of it. So why not be able to make money off your own name? Uh, obviously we are still working on that with, uh, we got a Alpha, the Elpa Euroleague Association, so we're still trying to work on that and get stuff done. Obviously, I don't think I'm gonna be in the league by the time they get that going, but uh, they're trying. They're trying to uh, trying to slowly get there to that point where they can try to profit off their own name and their likeness. So hopefully, it happens sometime soon. But I think it's definitely a process of it. Yeah, I think it's. I think too, man. Uh, you know, for for players that you know are really, let's just say, um, selling selling tickets, like when uh, when, like when Sheck West or whoever signed in uh, well, he signed in Paris, like during the pandemic for like a couple games, or even like Jake Cole or whatever it is. Like, yeah. I think when you have people that are, you know, bringing putting asses in them seats, like uh, I feel like they do deserve, you know, to get some type of a cut you know, out of that action. But uh, you also know these European teams going to try and keep every penny to themselves. Yeah, they, right? They're trying to. They're, everybody broke. Uh, you ask anybody, <laughs> every team, they say, yeah, we don't got no money. We don't, we don't got no money. <laughs> no, matter, no matter who they pay, no matter what you heard, no, mm-mm, we don't got no money right now. Yeah, these, these European <laughs> teams be acting like Terry Crews on Everybody Hates Chris, don't they? Bro, hey, <laughs> listen. Bro, we just seen y'all sign this guy for $6 million, $5 million. Nope, mm-mm, we don't got it. So uh, That's funny, man. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> but, yo, closing out, man, we got a, a last section, paycheck, rain check. Somebody's paycheck is t- taking a rain check. And surprise, surprise, this week it is Draymond Green. <laughs> everybody everybody knows the situation with Draymond Green and Jordan Poole. Um, you know, getting into the uh, physical altercation, there was a lot of rumors about what was said over the course of, uh, you know, some practices and things of that nature. I've, I've been hearing a lot of crazy stories, not sure what's true, what's not. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so what's the craziest altercation y'all have seen as a pro how is it handled, and uh, is there a code of conduct or a line you don't cross as uh, as teammates? Have I seen any? You know, man, I haven't had any, man. My my ten years <laughs> over here, man, I've never seen 
altercation with uh with players or coaches. Obviously, you might get talk crazy or push, but I've never seen anything like what I've seen in that video. Never. Uh, <laughs> hey, you went I, to you, Iowa State, man. I know you've seen something. <laughs> no, man. I've been, yeah. it's been pretty. It's been pretty good, man. I have not seen anything. Uh, probably the player, player I've played with was Royce. But <laughs> Royce is funny by far. Hey, listen. Royce, Royce. Oh, hey, listen. Hey, I, shit, I, I got into it with Royce in high school at AU, man. Man, I, I got into it with Royce. <laughs> and uh, at the end, when I went home that night, I'm like, you know, that was a bad that was a bad business decision on you, man. You could have really hurt you. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's, a, that's a, Royce, 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 my dog now. But man, me and Royce got into it in a parking lot in Orlando, man. And I, I don't think I've ever swung that hard at somebody and missed. I swung so hard and missed. I fell down like two hands on the ground. Hey, <laughs> like, <laughs> they broke it up. They broke it up when I missed. Otherwise, it might have been bad. It, it might. It could have been bad, man. man. It could, it could, it could, I walked up on Royce. I was in his space and. When I went home, I'm just like, man, he could have really – you wouldn't have made it out of there. Yeah, bro, he's – that's a big guy, man. That's, that's I still a, remember when this guy – uh, this guy was – uh, we were in open gym, and one of the assistant coaches tried to kick him out of practice. <laughs> and uh, he took a water bottle, and he threw it. The uh, Royce threw the water bottle to the other side of the court. Water went everywhere. And he told the guy, I was like, hey, you say something else, that's you next. The assistant coach just got up <laughs> and walked out the gym and went to his office. <laughs> hey. I said, hey. Hey, hey bro, he told me, hey, I'm going to throw you next. Hey, bro, he literally <laughs> got up and that's... walked out. I'm not going to tell you what the assistant hey, coach was, but for sure he, he got up and said, all right, I'm going to get him out of here. <laughs> Oh, man, I, I I ain't gonna I ain't gonna say no names either. But the craziest thing I done had is uh I was I was in uh, Israel, and you know in Israel, everybody know you can you know. Was you there when Goonie got when Goonie got? No, no, <laughs> no, that was bro, Goonie. Goonie. Goonie probably done got knocked out. Like bro, I, probably, I, I don't know how many dudes. I know I, you see I somebody put, trying I to fight Goonie. On Goonie. I put hands yeah, on Yeah, I was gonna say. <laughs> Hey, 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 we all played it. We all played it. Hulon, and I was gonna bring Goonie up earlier, but I was like, let me let the show progress a little bit. Oh, yeah, oh we bring up Goonie. <laughs> that's, that's, Goonie had me. Goonie, man. You know how you grab somebody in the back of their neck? I had yeah. a Goonie in the back of his neck in a timeout one day, dog. He was talking crazy. I'm like, bro, hey, man. Shut, shut up. <laughs> but Goonie, Goonie's different, man. Goonie's different. Goonie is deep. He used, he used to do that thing where he would win in practice or some shit, and at uh, game point, he'd throw a pass and just run down to the bench and sit down and drink his eye. I mean, I used to want to go over there and just strangle no. this little motherfucker. No, Goonie, Goonie was different, man. That guy was different. <laughs> but, but, no, it wasn't Goonie. I had a teammate who was, uh, you know, in Israel, obviously, everybody know if you, if you choose, you can, you know, you can smoke if you want to, whatever. Yeah. But there was a little period of time where – where uh, they kind of shut it down. It was like, oh, they're going to be tested. So mm-hmm. everybody had, everybody kind of quit. One of my teammates was going through a little bit of, you know, withdrawals or whatever it was. So he was mad at practice. Like he was in a bad, normally the happiest dude ever. He was in a bad mood at practice all the time. And one of this dude, Bookman, Carmel Bookman, man, said something. It wasn't even that crazy. This man sprinted across the gym and split his shit right here. He still got the scar, man. We all in the group chat now. He sent the scar the other day talking about laughing or laughing about it. But he was blood bleeding down his whole shit. And Bookman, the nicest dude, like. Bro, I play, dude, I play with Bookman. I play with Bookman. Book? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know Bookman. Like, Bookman ain't about to fight nobody, man. It was one, it, it was one of the things that was like. <gasps> but it was also, I was over there rolling like that, man. What you what you doing, dog? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I, I really can't think of anything, man. It's, I done played with some some real professionals, man. I can say that, man. Real <laughs> real professionals, man. That's, that's all I can say, man. Obviously, it's always, it's always one guy. It's always one guy on the team. One of the local guys that just out there just yeah. following. Just, yeah. 
trying to make. I your punched life one hell. of my teammates. I punched one of my teammates. Ah! And it, yeah, for sure he was a local guy. For sure he was. Yeah, he was a local yeah. guy. He was one of those. He was one of them guys. Like he, you know, he's running during the walkthrough, just going way too hard. You know, yeah, and I just wasn't having it that day. It's always one of them. Yeah. Yeah. Stanford, you punching people out here? Hey man, I I was I went to Stanford, but I might as well lived in Oakland because I was uh, I was chasing hood rats. I was chasing hood rats. I was on the wrong side of town always. So <laughs> I always been with the shits. <laughs> oh man, that's funny, man. That's funny, man. Hey, man, well that's all we got for you, man. We appreciate you pulling up, man. I'm Jordan Taylor. That's Anthony Goods. Will Clyburn. We're gonna have to have you back, man, and, and love. And appreciate it. good luck the rest of the year. We're gonna right, be man. pulling for you and supporting, man. Appreciate it, man. Appreciate it for having me, man.